Amen. So good to see you today. My name is Casey, if we haven't met. And uh, for those of you that were here last week, I just want to settle something right off the top. See, David preached last week, and, and as he was teaching, he said that, yes, I was in Detroit picking up a table, and he told you to ask me about that table. So here it is. Right there. Do you see it? Yep. That's a table we went to get. And, uh, and, and, and this was our table from South Africa. Many of you have already asked me about it, so I've been able to share this. And I just thought I'd take care of everybody at once and show it all. And this is actually what it is right here. This is a picture of it. Um, and it just, this is the reason we went to get it. One, it's beautiful. Because that's actually the natural color. It's not, uh, it's an African blackwood. And I'm not going to sell you on my table. But it's a beautiful unstained uh, wood. And, and this is why that table is so important to us. Why uh, is because... We went over to South Africa, many of you know, to be uh, missionary church planners. We started a church in Port Elizabeth, South Africa. And many of the people that uh, began following Jesus ate a meal with us around that table. Many of the people we love uh, there have had uh, a meal around that. So that represents a couple things. It really represents to me the local church. Uh, it it re represents that. And, and the reason that um, I believe in, 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 in the local church. And the reason this is so important is because uh, of why we went over there to s plant the church in South Africa. Uh, one the reason is that Jesus, uh, we, I believe Jesus asked us clearly and I heard without a shadow of a doubt, hey, I want you to go start a church. Even if though I didn't want to, just so you know, I didn't want to go, but I wanted to, honor, I wanted to obey Jesus more than anything. And, um, and so that was the one. And the second reason is I believe in the local church. I believe the local church, as Bill Hybels once said, is the hope of the world. I believe that. It was the local church that was my hope, and I believe it's the local church that is many of your hopes here today. But there might may be a couple of you here today that the local church hasn't been your hope. In fact, it was maybe the local church that has failed you. Or maybe it was the local church that um, hurt you. When I say failed you or hurt you, it's not necessarily the church itself as we have in America defined it because in America, we've kind of defined the local church as a structure and a location, like, like the building is the church. Like when we drive by, we say, hey, there's the church that we go to. Or what church do you go to? Oh, it's over there. But I think we've got a misunderstanding of what church is. And see, I believe the local church is the hope of the world and it's not the church as in a location, it's something else and we're gonna explore that today. And, and, but maybe you're here today and it wasn't the local, it was, it was the church that you say hurt you. And when you say it's the church that hurt you or destroyed your hope or, or tainted your view of God, it's, it's not that the building itself or the location, it was the people that did it. Maybe you got hurt in church by somebody hurting you and somebody, and, and, and that drove you away. Or maybe somebody said something in church and, and that kind of distorted your view of God and, and, and you said, I'd never go to church again. And if you're here today, I want to tell you, thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being here with us today. And I hope that today that uh, is something that, that is refreshing to you as we uh, hopefully redefine for you what the church never was for you, hope and healing and the reason it is. And, and so in this, I, I believe that every church has to wrestle with two foundational questions. Every church, every, or every, every expression of the local church needs to answer two questions and and. To give them to you, I'm gonna put them in a statement in a way. So write this in your notes. See, knowing what the church is and who the church is for will determine the answer to what does the church do? And maybe that's been your question. Maybe you've asked, hey, what is it that the church does? Is it the church, is this what the church does? We gather together and we sing songs and you listen to a lecture. Hopefully you don't feel like this is a lecture. <laughs> Hopefully it's a little more entertaining and at least if you leave going, that wasn't that bad. <laughs> See, is that what church is? And that, is that what the church does? Is this what it's all about? See, we have, but in order to ask that question, what is, does the church do? We've got to wrestle down two questions. Is what is the church? And who is the church for? And, and to answer the, this, I believe, first of all, we, we ask the question, so what is the church? And in order to answer that, we've got to go to Scripture. If, if we are biblically founded and, and, and if we want to we know what it is, we got to look at Scripture first to identify what the church is. And what was the church? Well, in order to find the first mention of church, we go to Acts, not Acts, Matthew chapter 16, where Jesus is with his disciples and he asks a very bold question that I don't, 
I don't, um, I don't recommend you ask your best friends or your people in your school or, or even your family this question. But he asked the question, so who do people say that I am? Could you imagine asking that to your best friend? <laughs> no, so so what, what's the community say about me? <laughs> you might not get what you wanna hear. <laughs> So Jesus asked this of his closest disciples. Hey, who do people say that I am? And the disciples say, well, there's some rumors going around that, uh, that you're kind of like John the Baptist, even though he's dead, he, he came back to life, okay? Others say that you're a great teacher. Some say you're a prophet. Some say you're another prophet that has died, but you, you came back to life. Isn't that crazy, Jesus? <laughs> That's who they say you are. And Jesus turns the question to them. A question I believe he wants all of us to see and understand and wrestle with. Who do you say that I am? And that's what he says here. He goes, what about you? Read this along with me in Matthew chapter 16. But what about you, he asks. Who who do you say I am? And Simon Peter, uh, one of my favorite uh, people in the New Testament, um, other than Jesus, (laughs) he answers. He goes, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Now, see, we can read over that. But I want you to see something here. See, at this moment in time, Israel, which was this nation that had been following God for many years, had this promise thousands of years ago that a Messiah, a Christ would come. And that's why we call him Jesus Christ. It's Jesus Messiah. And that word Christ means anointed one, a deliverer. It was the Messiah. It was the prophesied one of all ages who is going to come and rescue the nation of Israel. And when Peter says, you are the Messiah, he was recognizing that he was the prophesied one that Israel has been waiting on because this person was gonna come and set up a new government, a new kingdom, a new way to live. I just don't think they knew it was going to look a lot different than the way they wanted it to look. And in this, he says, you're the Messiah. And then he says something else. You're the son of of the living God. And in in this time and age where Augustus had just declared himself as a God and the son of God, that rose up in a public arena that you and I don't get by reading scripture. We have to know church history for this. That Jesus was setting himself as equal as God. And Peter says, you not only are the deliverer, the promised one, the anointed one, but you are the true son of God. You are God. Look what Jesus says. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. He gives him his, his, the name his mama gave him. <laughs> You're Simon, son of Jonah. That's, your, that's who you are. For this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood. In fact, it's just not, you, you couldn't come up with that with on your own, boy. That's what he's saying. But by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter. And that word Peter is, is, is a Greek word. That's, it's, it's Petros. It's like a little rock. You know, like a little rock you'd throw in a creek or that you'd skip across a pond. That's what you are, you're Petros. You're, you're, you're little rock. You, you little stone. <laughs> and then he goes, and on this rock, and it's a different word here, it's Petros. And what's he saying? On this big, magnificent cliff, <laughs> this mountain, <laughs> this huge rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Maybe you grew up Catholic and you, or in a a traditional, more an orthodox worldview and and, and belief system, and you grew up seeing this verse and you said, well, Peter's that rock. You know, God, he built the church and Peter was the one who went out in Acts and built the church and that was the rock. You know, and and I don't disrespect that. I think that could could be true. But I believe there's another way of looking at the scripture. As Jesus says, hey, yeah, you're Peter, which you're small rock, but I want to tell you what the greater rock on this is. It's that you, what you knew, that I am the Messiah. I'm the rescuer, I'm the savior, I'm the deliverer, and I'm the son of a living God, a God that's not dead, and on that rock, I'm going to build my church. And when we see this word church, see, we don't understand this word church because when you and I understand it, most of us, like we, it's location and building. That's what we think of as church, that this is the church. What church do you go to? I go to the church over there. Or what church do you go to? I go to the church over there. 
Well, Jesus doesn't use that. In fact, the word that we have for church, just to give you a little bit of history, comes from a German translation, which is Kirch, and, and that is a location or building or structure. And we got a poor translation. I'll just be honest that when they dr translated the Bible into English, they used this German word and used that. And it's a poor translation because we put a location with it. And Jesus said, no, no, it's an ecclesia. And an ecclesia is a gathering. And what's Jesus say? I'm gonna build a gathering of people. I'm gonna build a movement of people that are gonna gather together on my mission to bring my kingdom. And that's what I want you to write in. See, the church is a gathering of people for Jesus to bring his kingdom. So who is the church for? What is the church? Well, the church is a gathering. And who is the church for? Is it just for the, the insider? Is it just for us that are in the church? Is it like this inside club that we come and we do everything for us and we exclude everybody else? Well, if you look at the life of Jesus, Jesus spent a lot of time with the people that were far from God. He spent a lot of the time with the people who are totally unlike him, not like the people on the inside. He spent a lot of time with that. And I think the answer to that question is, no, the church is not just for the insider. So then is the church for the outsider? Is the church then for the outsider? I love what William Temple said. William Temple said this about the church. He said, the church is the only organization that does not exist for itself, but those who live outside of it. So is the church then, are the empty seats here reserved only for those? Is this a place, is this a gathering? Are we a people that only exist for those outside the church that are not here yet, that are far from God? And I believe if you looked at the life of Jesus, even though he spent a lot of time with them, and he spent time with them, he also spent a lot of time with his disciples. He spent a lot of time meeting with them, teaching them, sharing meals together with them. And so it's not just only for the outsider, it's not just for the inside. Then who's the church for? Is it for insiders and outsiders? No. The church is for Jesus. See, Jesus said, I will build my church. And I think this is what happens over time, is we come to church thinking, no, this is my church. This is my church. My, my kids will walk in the hall and I've got them saying, hey, hey guys, whose church is this? Is it daddy's church? No. Is it Westside Family's church? No. Whose church is this? Dad, this is Jesus' church. That's what this is. That's what the church says. He said, I'm gonna build my church and that church, the church that is my church, not your church, my church, hell itself can't stop it. So what are we doing we are a church who is gathered on jesus mission to expand his kingdom to build his king now his kingdom is kingdom is a word that we don't really get in today's language either just like we kind of miss we don't understand church really because of the mistranslation this is not a mistranslation we just don't understand kingdom in today's world because we live in a republic we don't live in a kingdom we, we live in, 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 a, in a totally different way of government. And the, Jesus saying, hey, I'm gonna build my ecclesia that's about my kingdom. And my kingdom is about my rule and my reign. And when the Israelites believed that Jesus was gonna set up a new government, he was. But it wasn't gonna look like the governments of our day and age. See, his kingdom is about people who are far from him, disconnected from God, far from God, turning toward God by trusting in him. It's his, his kingdom comes when people who are far from God begin to turn toward him and begin to follow him and begin to trust in him. That's when his kingdom comes. See, his kingdom comes through the hearts of the people. Hearts that, that have been disconnected from him and turning toward him. And that's a serious big idea that we're gonna be looking at. See, this is what the church does is we are a gathering on Jesus' mission to expand his kingdom. By loving Jesus, becoming like Jesus, and sharing Jesus with people who are far from God. We are a gathering on Jesus' mission to expand his kingdom because it's his church. We are his gathering for his purpose. And we're not here for my preference. We're not here for your preference. And this is where this church, I believe, gets really distorted is when we make church about our preference instead of Jesus' purpose. We want to realize that what the church is is a gathering of people and who the church is for. It's for Jesus. But what does that look like? 
Well, that looks like his kingdom coming because that was his mission. And his kingdom is all about people who are far from God turning toward God and putting their trust in him. And, and it's about us becoming more like Jesus and loving Jesus in return and sharing Jesus. It's about you and I allowing his kingdom to come in us so it can come through us. That, that is what the church is, is a gathering of people living on Jesus' mission to expand his kingdom. So what is it that we do? Well, every church is unique and there are many different expressions of church that God has called. And this is what we do is a series that I want to let you in on why we, what we do as a local church. Because maybe you're here and go, what, what is it that we do as a local church? What is it that we feel like we are called to do? And this is how I want us to look at this is we're gonna look at five directional values that we as a local church have. And this mission to love Jesus, become like Jesus, and share Jesus. Why? Because we are his gathering on his purpose to expand his kingdom, not ours. And what this does is that we're gonna look at the first one today, and the first one is glorifying Jesus. That's our first one that we're gonna look at, is we are glorifying Jesus. And that word glorify is one that we really don't understand in today's language. I, I understand it. It's not like you go, hey, we glorify. You're like, What? Glorify really means to put as the most important thing. It's to set it up above everything else. So people see that over everything else. So when your life glorifies Jesus, it's people see Jesus in your life more than they see you. Isn't that amazing? Wouldn't it be amazing having a local gathering where people see Jesus instead of us? Wouldn't it be amazing in our community, in our world, if the, if the church on Jesus' mission, people saw Jesus? that we were the true body of Christ. And they saw Jesus, not us. They saw the character of Jesus being living in of us. And that's what glorifying means. It's when people see Jesus and people who are far from God turn toward God and begin loving Jesus, becoming like Jesus and sharing Jesus. That glorifies him. So our teaching big idea for today is this right here, that we are glorifying Jesus by living on Jesus' mission. And we here at Westside Family Church, we believe that our mission is really what every one of us as a, a Christ follower is called to, to love Jesus, become like Jesus, and share Jesus. And when we do that, the kingdom of God, I believe, comes into our lives and it becomes a part of us and goes through us to the people around us. And that gives glory to Jesus because we're here for his mission. It's his church and it's not my church and it's not your church, it's his. And his church is all about him. It's all about us loving him, becoming like him, and sharing him. But we gotta first check our motivation of, of, for the first part of this. It's all about our motivation. And our motivation is that in loving him is this right here. Write this in your notes. See, we are loving Jesus because he first loved us. We are loving Jesus because he first loves us. This is how we glorify Jesus and live on mission is we, we respond to his love for us because he first loved us loves us. We can only glorify Jesus when we see what Jesus has done for us, when we see his grace that is a product of his love that has been exposed to you and I by him, by God sending Jesus to come to this earth and die for your sins and mine. For, for everything that we are and we can't be, he lives and he becomes and he takes on the punishment of all of our sins. And in an act of love, because you can't have love without sacrifice. You can think about that and sit on that for a while. And Jesus says, I'm gonna show you so much love and you're gonna see it because no greater love than a man lay down his life for his friend and that's what I'm gonna be for you. It's a display of love. And what do we do in return? Is we love in return. That's what 1 John 4, 19 says, is we love because he first loved us. In our life group, we have two brand new babies that have been born in the last month. And I got to hold both of them this last week. It was in, this, in the life group. It was amazing. And in this, I love watching parents with the newborn because it reminds me of when we had our babies as newborns. And there's something that happens when if you hold your child and you go, how could I love him anymore? It's like, it's like where did this love come from? And you have this, old, this amazing love for your child that does nothing for you in return except keep you up, cost you a lot of money and spit up all over you. <laughs> That child doesn't know how to love. That is not love. <laughs> but you know, that's how God's love is for us. And being a parent is a, just a taste of God, a taste of God's love for you. 
But being a child and having that child, that child doesn't know how to love the parent back. You know what that child's gonna learn how to do? It's gonna learn how to respond to the love that the parent has for them. And that's our relationship with Jesus. That's how we love Jesus is we respond to his love for us. So we glorify Jesus. Write this in your notes. When we are loving Jesus by living for Jesus. How do we respond to him? We live for him. When we realize how much he loves us, then we turn our life for him and we live for him. And this is how he said, hey, this is the most important way to live. In fact, someone asked him, hey, what's the most important thing to do? What's the most important commandment, Jesus? And Jesus said, this is the most important commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Then he says, this is the first and greatest commandment. This is the first and most important thing that you can do to love God with everything you are. But we can only love him as a response to who he is. So we need to learn to grow in knowing who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for us. And that will grow our love for him that leads us to love him with all of our life. So we're glorifying Jesus by loving Jesus. And second, we're glorifying Jesus when this right here, write this in, we are becoming like Jesus because his Holy Spirit lives in us. We're becoming like Jesus when his Holy Spirit lives in us. We glorify him when we look more like him. We glorify him when we are gathering together and, and together we look more like Jesus. And we're, when, we, when our character begins to reflect his character. Now here, I just gotta let you in on something. This is freeing for some and disheartening for others maybe. You don't have what it takes to be like Jesus in your own. You don't have what it takes. In fact, if you did, you would have already done it. But you've tried and you've tried and many of you here, that, that there might be something that you've tried to stop for a while or you tried to start for a while and you just can't do it. Why? Because you on your, in your own abilities do not have what it takes to be like Jesus. You don't have what it takes to look like him. But Jesus wants to partner with us. And this is how he does it. This is how God showed his love for us. And this is what 1 John go, says in that same passage that we read earlier in that same section. He says this right here. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love God, but he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, I want you to underline this part. We also ought to love one another. Since God so loved you, you know what you need to do? Love each other. That's what he's saying. It's simple. God showed his love for you, show your love for each other. Then he goes on to say, dear friends, okay, no one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. Just pause real quick. So first, how do we glorify Jesus? Well, first we glorify Jesus by loving Jesus as a response to his love for us. And that response is we live for him. And the second way we glorify Jesus is we love each other. We, we love each other. This is how we, we glorify him. We, we, we love the people around us. We, we love the people on the inside. Because I believe when people see the way you're loving each other, they wanna be a part of that. It's like the kids playing on the playground and the outside kids on the outside of the fence come up and go, man, I wanna be a part of that. They don't want to be a part of it if they're not getting along. <laughs> but when the world around us sees us loving each other, they're going to come to the fence of the church, this gathering and say, oh, I long for that. I long for someone to, to treat me with that dignity or that acceptance. I long for that. And you know what happens? Is when you and I are becoming more like Jesus, it only happens when we're together with each other. But we can't do it alone. See, you can't do it alone. And this is, Jesus proved it to us in this right here because look what he says next. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit. What's he saying? You can't, you can't love each other unless the spirit of God is living inside of you. You can't love unless the Holy Spirit is inside of you because there's something that happens when Jesus is inside of us with the Spirit. It's something that happens when he begins to live inside of us. Paul said it this way. You're gonna pop out fruit. And that fruit is character unlike your character. 
And that character is going to look like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And, and nothing's going to be able to, to hold those things down. In fact, there's no law going to keep that from coming out because the Holy Spirit is in, inside of you, making your character different. And there's something unique about that fruit. See, that fruit is relational. You can't grow in love without being in relationships with others. You can't have true love, joy because people aren't going to make you happy, by the way. Maybe I say this again. People aren't going to make you happy, <laughs> by the way. And joy is not a state of happiness. Joy is something that the Holy Spirit produces in us, in our relationship. It's, it's through peace that we become people who work for peace in a relationship and are patient with others. See, you can't, have, you can't have this fruit and exhibit this fruit alone. You can't. You can't grow in this fruit alone. You can't become more like Jesus alone. You can't do it segregated from community. This is why we encourage you to be in a Jesus-centered community. And one of the ways that we provide Jesus-centered communities and want to help you is through life groups. This is why we entice you and encourage you and try to compel you because this is how you're gonna be more like Jesus. When you isolate yourself, you're isolating yourself away from becoming more like him. Because we glorify him when we love each other, but if we can't be in a relationship where we're loving each other, we're not gonna be able to grow in becoming more like him. Look what Jesus says in John 15. He says this, well, first of all, write this in. See, we glorify Jesus when we're becoming like Jesus and loving each other. That's how we glorify him, when we're becoming like Jesus and loving each other. And this is what Jesus says. In John 15, he says, this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Did you catch that? This is how you're gonna glorify me. You're gonna, sh this is to my, my Father's glorify glory, that you bear much fruit. And you can't do this on your own. All you, we can do is be faithful to live for him and he produces the character in us and that character only comes in community. That character only comes when we're in relationship with each other. So how do we glorify Jesus? One, we're loving Jesus as a response to his love for us. And secondly, we're becoming like him by loving each other. We're loving Jesus and we're loving each other. And then third, we are sharing Jesus because we want his kingdom to come to people who are far from God. This is what we do. We are sharing Jesus because we want his kingdom, not our kingdom. We're sharing Jesus because we want his glory, not our glory. We're sharing Jesus because we want people who are far from God to turn toward God and begin trusting in Jesus. Trusting in him as the, as the one who can live the perfect life that we could never live. Trusting in him that he could pay the penalty for sin that we could never pay by dying for us. And trusting in him that because he's alive again today that he invites them and you and I into new life. And all we have to do Simply say, Jesus, I trust you and I want to follow you. I trust you and I want to follow you. And when he does that, he puts a spirit inside of us and we then have the power now to love him, become like him and love each other and share Jesus now. And when we share Jesus, we're joining Jesus on his mission to love the world. That's his mission Jesus said in Luke chapter 19, he said, I, the, the son of man, me, I, I, and this is a title he gives himself that really puts him equal with God. He says, the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. Now, maybe you hear that term and you, there's a little, I don't like that word lost. See, I don't like that word lost. I'm a guy, I get it. I was lost at Silver Dollar City a while back with my family. And when you, when you have to go to the bathroom and you got to get it a ride that your kids really want to get to and you're not there in time, you might as well just admit you're lost. You know what lost means? I just don't know how to get where I'm going. I just don't know how to get where I'm going. And there are many people, maybe you're here today and, you're, and you could say, I'm far from God and I don't know really how to get to God. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm disconnected and I, wanna, I, I feel like I'm far from him and I want to come back to him. And, and you, you don't know Jesus is here to seek and save all of us who are far from him and are looking our way to get back to God. Because Jesus came and he lived the life that you couldn't live and he died the death that you deserve to die but it, and, and, and took the punishment that you deserve to pay, but he took it upon himself to show you that he loves you. And all he wants from you to be reconnected to God, to, 
to get out of the lost categories, to find, like I found the undertaker, and I'm not saying Jesus is an undertaker, just so that, but the undertaker at Silver Dollar City, I said, hey, can you help me find my way back to this place right here? And when we say, God, will you help me find you? And we look to Jesus as the one who brings us back to God and say, Jesus, I trust in you enough to follow you. See, that is when his kingdom comes. That is when his kingdom comes, when people who are far from God turn toward God by trusting in Jesus. So how do we do that? Well, here at Westside, we engage in bless, which I believe is a wonderful rhythm where we begin with prayer, we listen, we eat together. That's why that table was so important in our world is because that is how we join Jesus in his mission, in his kingdom there in South Africa. And when we find an opportunity to serve the people so we can share the story. See, it's through serving people. What Jesus did for us, he came to serve us. That we have the opportunity to share the good news. Write this in your notes. See, we glorify Jesus when we share Jesus by doing good deeds to love the world. See, I believe we do good deeds to build goodwill so we can share good news. And more specifically, we can be good news. This is what Jesus said about the church. He said, you, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Remember that little song, this little light of mine. <laughs> he goes, neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine. In the same way, let your light shine. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds. They may see the good that you do and not glorify you. They see, see the good you do and glorify your Father in heaven. See, a lot of times I think we do good so we can look good. You know what that is? That's pride. And a lot of times we'll try to do good so, so if we feel good. There's nothing wrong in that. It's just more philanthropy. We do good. So Jesus is seen. And when that happens, Jesus is glorified. And when we do good so Jesus is glorified, that is powerful. So what is it that we do? We glorify Jesus. How do we glorify Jesus? We're glorifying Jesus by loving Jesus. We're glorifying Jesus by becoming more like Jesus and loving each other. And we're glorifying Jesus by sharing Jesus and loving the world around us. This is what we do. What would it look like for a gathering of people in Leavenworth, Kansas, in Leavenworth County that come from all over our county to come and we gather? But we don't gather with our church. We gather because it's his church. And we gather because of what he's done for us and it compels us to, that we've got to love each other and we've got, to, we've got to see each other and we see each other the way Jesus sees each other and there's a care and a love for each other and we've got to, we've got to express that love for each other and we see not just the, the way that we love Jesus by living for him and the, loving each other but we see the world where we live, where we work, where we play and we are so compelled that we want to gather together to be sent together to love them, to love the world. See, we believe as a church, and, and, and this is the first time we've, we're saying that we've been praying about this, that we wanna have an impact. What's our impact in the future? Not that it's about us in our glory, and it's not about us and, 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 and what Westside, but it's about his kingdom. How do we want to, how do we expand his kingdom where it's about pe people far from God, turning toward God and loving Jesus, becoming like Jesus and sharing Jesus? What would that look like? And we've been praying and we believe truly that in the next 10 years, we can, be, we can influence over 10,000 people living on mission. Why? Because it's about his kingdom. It's about his church. And I wanna be a gathering that, that nothing is too impossible and far more immeasurably, immeasurably more than I could ever ask or think or imagine God could do through a people who are gathered together on his mission. Now, does that mean 10,000 people here? No, don't get scared. But I believe we could influence the world. I believe you could be in a gathering that influences the world, not for your kingdom and to feel good and to look good, but that Jesus is seen all over the world. And, and we've been praying, God, what would it look like 
to, to see the world and begin to make an impact in the world. We believe that we could plant two churches in the next three years internationally. What would that look like? We're praying, God, we believe this, we see this, but we want it for your kingdom and your purpose. We believe that we're in a situation, and many of you here are, are here because you're in the military, and you're here for a year, and, and you feel like, you, man, you, you don't want to leave, and I get it, or you may want to leave, I understand that, maybe too, but here's the thing, is you might be leaving, and, and you, you're just leaving. See, I don't want you to leave, I want you to be sent because you're not leaving. God is positioning you in a slingshot to where you're going to go all over this world. And you may be here for three years. You may be here for two years. You may be here for one year. But what it, would it look like for you to say, you know what, when I leave this place, I'm not leaving, I'm being sent. And what would it look like to see 50 military families in the next three years say, I wanna be commissioned on mission so that wherever I go, me and my family, we're loving Jesus, we're becoming like Jesus, we're sharing Jesus. Why? Because it's about his kingdom. It's about his church. And I'm on that mission. What would it look like for us to be a, a, a community that's just not reaching globally, but we're also reaching locally? And, and what would it look like for us to be a church who, who gets healthy and we, 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 have, we love each other? And that means that we're in community with each other. And this goes viral, that, that we love each other and we, 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 have to, we see that we have to live in community. See, I believe in the next three years that we need 100 life groups a hundred life groups. Why? Because we want to reach 150 new families. And those 150 new families, they need places that they can become like Jesus. They can grow in their relationship with Jesus by growing in the relationship with each other. And that might mean that some of you here need to be a life group leader. You need to, maybe God's been stirring your heart. Now's the time to step in. Because we need to create environments where people can connect in community because it's in community that we become more like Jesus. What would it look like? for us to be a community that's growing in our relationship and loving each other the way that Jesus wants us to. And what would it look like to, to take that impact and, and see that impact the world around us and, and our life groups and, 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 and without, being, uh, without it being a church-sanctioned event, they begin to look at the people with where, where they live, work, or play and they begin to say, hey, who are the people around us that are far from God that Jesus might be working in and how can we bless them? How can we engage them? How can we serve them? How can we do good deeds to build the goodwill? Not that we look good or feel good, but that Jesus is glorified. What would that look like? And what would come about of that? What would it look like if Westside Family Church in the next three years, we planted another campus that reaches an area of our town where people won't be able to drive to a location because it's not about location, it's about a gather. What if we begin to multiply our gathering? And we begin, begin to graft it in this part of the community. What if we planted another church here in the Leavenworth County or in the vicinity within us? What would it look like? Why? Not that we look good. Not that we feel good. Because this is what we do. We glorify Jesus. And we point people to him. So this is what I want to ask you. There's no offering there's no nothing after this just so you know <laughs> will you say yes will you say yes will you say yes that i will leverage my life to love jesus and love each other and love the world will you say yes to that 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 i will love jesus by loving jesus loving each other and loving the world will i love jesus by and become like jesus and share jesus and will i say yes and, and, and will, I, will I leverage my life for this mission? Will I leverage my, my, my time? Will I give my time to, to, to do this? Will I give up some time to be with the community? Will I give up time to serve? Will I give up time to serve in a children's ministry so people, the kids can find Jesus? Will I give up time to, to, to serve in my community? Will I give up some money? Will I give up some resources? Because I want his mission. It's his kingdom. It's his, perfect, his, his purpose more than my preference. And will I give my life? Because Jesus said, whoever seeks to find my life will lose it for my sake. And whoever loses their life for me will find life. Will you say yes to that? Because this is what we do. We glorify Jesus. And we're a church that is a gathering on Jesus' mission to expand his kingdom by loving Jesus, becoming like Jesus, and sharing Jesus. And when you and I are doing that, we are glorifying Jesus. This is what 
we do. Let me pray for us. Jesus, thank you. Pray that you give us all the wisdom and the courage that we need to say yes to loving you, becoming like you, and loving each other, and loving the world, which is sharing you with the world around us. God, I pray that as we do this, Jesus, you're glorified, that you're lifted high, and people who are far from you will turn to you, and those of us in here will become more like you, and that'll glorify you, and we'll understand your love for us in a brand new way that it leads us to live our life for you. In your name, Jesus, amen. God bless you, Westside. We'll see you next Sunday.